Hello, welcome to this hybrid event on the Conference on the Future of Europe. Europe is at no doubt uh, at the crossroads. In the last decade, we have seen a number of crises shaking the foundations of the Union, including a sovereign debt crisis following the biggest financial crisis since the Great Depression. A refugee wave leading to right-wing populism and Brexit and now a global pandemic. While Europe has weathered these storms and developed new policy tools to address the challenges on institutional front, the, the uh, development can be described as stagnation. To give new impetus to the project of an ever closer union, the European Parliament, the European Council and the European Commission have launched the Conference on the Europe, Future of Europe, which should bring together citizens to debate um, how we want, to we want a future union to look like. While citizens' involvement is widely welcomed, the conference has met many critics, some calling it a distraction of real democratic accountability. Today we want to discuss how these challenges that these projects want to address, as well as the question what role the conference might play or might not play. So for this I'm delighted to share today a formidable panel. My first guest tonight, or today, and this morning, is Calypso Nicolaidis. She's the Chair on International Affairs at the European University Institute. She was a previously a professor uh, at Harvard University, the Kennedy School of Government, and has published extensively on European affairs, including a recent book called Exodus, Reckoning, Sacrifice, The Three Meanings of Brexit. My second guest here today, uh, joining us live, is George Sapari, who is the Chief Advisor to, to the Governor of the European Hungarian Central Bank, and he has had a, a remarkable career in economics and policy making, including stationed at the IMF, the European Commission, and he was the Hungarian ambassador to the United States. Welcome. And my third guest, also joining us online, is Caroline de Grütte. She has uh, had a distinguished career as journalist uh, and a EU observer covering European politics and policy. She is currently the European correspondent of the NRC Handelsblatt, widely recognized as the Dutch newspaper of reference. Um, and is a member of European Council on Foreign Relations. Also welcome to you, Carolyn. Thank you all for being us with here today. Um, before we start with the discussion, I want to remind our audience that this is a hybrid event. Um, you can all join the debate, ask questions to the panelists. We are slide.do and the has hashtag is BAM21Europe. There you also will find a poll, a poll that we will reveal the, in the end of the discussion what the result is. And the poll for this session will ask, what do you think should be the main focus of European politics going forward? Should it be finding a common policy, foreign policy vo voice in a, in, a, yeah, in a world now shaped more and more by great power competition? Should it be um, that we, we need to develop a European policy, real democratic accountability, maybe the topic on the conference in the future of Europe, or should we actually just focus on solving policy issues, meaning, um, for instance, economic, economic cohesion, climate change, or, or just social issues. So now, with no further ado, I want to give the, the, the floor to Calypso to give us her initial remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much and it's always a great pleasure to collaborate with our colleagues in in google and um and to speak to um all of our friends out there who are concerned by all the topics you just outlined um so what i wanted to do is to share a, my a slide um so let me just do this right now So, can we all ask together, um, this moment we're in, we speak of democracy, we speak of geopolitics, but at the end of the day, what we didn't expect is all of this is happening in the context of a worldwide pandemic. Now, what I would like to argue today with this image of a democratic protest under COVID in Israel is that maybe um, this is a blessing. Maybe we have the correspondence of the Conference on the Future of Europe, a pandemic with all the dark side of the pandemic, but also a pandemic that can open up our democratic imagination, the sense of urgency, but the sense of possibility. So yes, you spoke just now of some cynicism, doubts about what this is all about, but I would like to give a, a brighter picture, a picture of hope and potential. 
And let me just do it in three parts very quickly. First of all, the why, and then the what, and then the how. So why are we all concerned about this? Let me give you three big arguments. First of all, and you just mentioned it, there's populism out there, good and bad populism. I think many of us are assuming that real genuine participation of citizen can be an alternative or an, a more fruitful version of bringing the people in to European decision-making. And that in turn is the key to European legitimacy. Maybe we should call it participatory populism, but let's not play magic tricks here. That is the challenge for the EU. Participation cannot be a token. It cannot be, well, we vaguely hear you, but we decide what we hear. Or, um, you know, we have assemblies, um, but we never ask you directly to make any kind of decision. So we need to think about what is genuine participation. There's huge amounts of study in there, not just by, you know, academics and university, but the OECD has just done an amazing study on the, the deliberative and participatory wave. This is what we're thinking about. And why is this important? For two other reasons. You know, the second reason is that, yes, this is the, the, what Bruegel is most working on. We have a recovery from 750 billion added to the budget of the EU. And that is one way or another going to be repaid by citizens because money is fungible. So more than ever, we have the slogan, no taxation without hmm, what representation or maybe without participation um, how are we spending this money should citizens have a direct say uh, knowledge and understanding and appropriation to lend their collective intelligence to the process avoid corruption and nepotism so this is the second big issue and and the, and the third of what is at stake is of course the systemic ledger. And you were just um, talking about basically Europe's geopolitical solitude. We know this better than ever uh, with the tragedy in Afghanistan. But what is at stake there indeed is this authoritarian versus democratic beauty contest. For our own citizens, um, let's note that a recent poll gives 52% of people under 25 who think authoritarianism works better than democracy for big decisions like pandemic or climate change. So this ledger is critical in the next decades of geopolitics. So if we believe all these three, what's at stake point, then the question is for me, I like to frame it in, in Dow's um, uh, terms. We had a first democratic transformation with Athens a second with republicanism and representation. And the question today is whether we can manage, there is a third democratic transformation in the world because of new technologies and new expectations. And I know Caroline will speak more about expectations. The question is how can we blend these to create a third democratic transformation? But the deeper question is whether EU institutions will ride that wave or will, they, will the rest of the world and, and new generations kind of take it on without the institutions? So this for me is the challenge that we're facing. And if that's the case, then this brings us to the what. Are we facing today, perhaps with Kofi, but more broadly, a democratic whatever it takes? And I believe many of us do, that this is what we need at this moment in Europe. Vis-a-vis -vis our own citizens, and vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world because of the geopolitical stakes, because of a world where um, if we're gonna have surveillance capitalism, we better have the underpinning democratic gains to hold it at bay. So then if this, the what, let me give you three examples. The first is, well, if we have this question of no taxation without um, participation, can we imagine a radical transparency? Can we imagine that the next generation fund will be on the web, accessible to all, for all to do things with it, to appropriate in different ways? This is what I call uh, the democratic panopticon as a kind of wink to darker understandings, but this is the people watching 
bureaucracy and politicians do their thing. Um, and in, the, in a way, this is about a radical expansion of the franchise in space and in time to, to next generations. Um, citizens as guardians. And of course, we always need to ask, whenever we think about schemes that have to do with democratic processes, rather than abstract democratic democracy, but democratic processes, that is the key. Now, who, who guards the guardians? You know, so, so who guards the people? The people are not some sort of you know, all-knowing entity. So spaces of democracy guard each other. Municipalities guard Brussels. Uh, countries guard each other, regions, um, and of course the onboard. Are we responsible ancestors? So we have a kind of, we want to imagine a system where the guardians, where the people are the guardians and they are themselves watched and watch each other. Now, very concretely, the key innovation of the Conference on the Future of Europe are these citizens' assembly. We're lucky enough at EUI to be hosting one of those for trans-European, because of course there will be assemblies all over Europe at all sorts of different levels. And I know my time is up in a minute, so I'm going through very quickly. Can we imagine a permanent, but also rotating in different cities, European citizens' assembly, perhaps headquarters in Strasbourg? Um, and of course, in the key to all of this is how do we um, engineer a system of distributed intelligence in Europe, uh, where Brussels is at the core of a hub of networks. And I think many people in the institutions and outside are thinking that way. So finally, to end on the how concretely, and we're going to speak more about this today with our conference, um, we have, yes, Kofi, we have a plenary assembly that is, will take the input from a digital platform and from citizens assembly. But we have all sorts of other things going on at the same time, which is always the case. And the question is, are these parallel processes, two separate worlds, one of kind of power politics and um, party politics and all the things we're familiar with, which are right and proper and legitimate. And then we have a kind of more effervescent citizens bottom up type of atmosphere, um, how will the two be connected is a very interesting question we need to ask. Um, and to close, I would suggest that, um, in fact, with the Citizens Take Over Europe, an NGO that I'm um, part of, uh, in fact, a network of 60 NGOs, um, the, the way what our call has to be that there will be a map of 10 principles that should inspire the conference on the future of Europe, this blue circle that you see there. Um, participation, as we've just said, both transnational and inclusive socially, the biggest challenge, because how do you make sure that more marginal groups or those who are not, you know, Euro fans uh, participate? Well, through deliberation and through a process that is more visible and attractive, and at the end of the day, open. Open institutionally, open to all sorts of people, and opening opening for our minds. So I hope that today in our conversation, we will think of the many ways in which openness can be delivered. Thank you. Thank you, Calypso, for this, uh, may I say, very optimistic take on the Conference of Europe that it might be spawn for a new way of or a new way of, of democratic um, governance. Let me now give the floor to George and for him to give us his thoughts on, on the challenges that the, conf uh, the conference should address. <clears throat> thank you very much. I would like to thank <coughs> the um, organizers for inviting me for this, uh, this panel. I will be speaking about the centripetal and centrifugal forces actually playing within the European Union. Why do I talk about it? If you look at the past decades, centripetal forces were dominating. Look at the four freedoms, Euro, Schengen, etc. But with GFC and COVID, new centrifugal forces appeared on the horizon. <clears throat> and we have to look at it, whether this, uh, uh, these forces, why they, why they emerged, uh, whether they pose a serious um, uh, problem for the future economic and political integration. And um, 
these are centrifugal forces that are not necessarily just economic. They are political and social. And they are not necessarily south, north, or east, west, but multidimensional. <clears throat> and I will mention four of those. One is mass immigration. Mass immigration, you have to understand the attitudes of the people to mass, to mass immigration. Western European countries had colonies overseas. UK, France, Spain, Italy, Belgium, Portugal, Netherlands. They had centuries to get to know a different culture. People from these colonies came progressively to these countries. First, the most educated one, and then <clears throat> the skilled one, and later on, you know, other segments of the society. Central and Eastern Europe did not have overseas colonies. So when um, within um, three months, in 2015, September to November, several hundred thousand of refugees arrived at the border of Hungary. Hungary was supposed to be a Schengen border. They arrived you know, just through the green, <clears throat> green fields. That showed that there is a problem. And what happened since then? Since then, Hungary was the first one who uh, erected, a, uh, erected a fence, but now they are building fences in, in, in Poland, in Latvia, uh, at the border with, uh, with uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, Belarus. And more and more people are saying, Germany, the Netherlands, France, that we cannot make the same mistake as we did in, in 2015. So that's the immigration problem, but that's gonna be with us because Europe is rich and defenseless. And the easiest way to come from Africa or from the Middle East, it's not to Latin America, it's not to the United States, it's to Europe. So that's an issue that we have to deal with and we have to realize that approaches to this for historical reasons are different from country to country. The next one I wanted to uh, <clears throat> mention is Russia and China, centripetal forces. Uh, <clears throat> now, we are talking a lot about 70 years of peace that the Euro, uh, European Union has brought uh, uh, to, to Europe. Well, for the 100 million people who lived in the East, that wasn't peace. That was status quo for the West, and it was Soviet communist domination in the East. So it's not the same thing. So they have not, and the West was very, very satisfied with the status quo, and it's only the Eastern European countries themselves who liberated themselves. So therefore, their uh, approach to Russia is different. Different to the Baltic states that were part of the Soviet Union, Poland, that has a border, was run over by Russia several times, or Hungary, that over the centuries suffered from um, <clears throat> uh, re rivalries between Russia and the Western world over, the, over, over its head. Hungary didn't start any of the wars. So we have different approaches to Russia. Those, the, the first one that I mentioned, they want a very strong, uh, uh, the very strong army need to army in their country to um, prevent a Russian uh, possible attack. Hungary is trying to play a little bit between the two. Uh, it's, um, <clears throat> uh, Hungary accepts all the, uh, uh, all the um, uh, sanctions, votes all the sanctions, but at the same time does not want to take the same hostile view, hostile view to Russia, because again, it's a little bit afraid if there's something comes between Russia and say Germany um, over its head. However, the Western um, <clears throat> attitude to Russia is also ambivalent. Look at uh, Northern Stream 2, okay? So on one hand you have a sanction, on the other hand you, you have cooperation in Northern Stream 2, which is actually for Central and Eastern Europe is a good thing because it's another, <clears throat> um, uh, pipeline that you can have uh, that bypasses Ukraine. 
Now, so that's the vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia. China, uh, the Central and Eastern Europe is part of the so-called 16 plus one, now it's with Italy 17 plus one, one road, one belt. Um, and um, in the Western part, it's, it's uh, looked at with um, some, uh, <clears throat> uh, some suspicion what the Chinese want there, etc. The Central and Eastern European countries look at, look at it, this is a, a, a possibility to increase trade with China. Now you have to know that the trade of the Central and Eastern Europe with China dwarfs <laughs> between the trade between Western Europe and, and, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and the United States. But again, this is a sort of a divisive force. It, not not every, every divisive force is of the na same nature or the same danger, but I'm just telling those so that people know, realize that uh, <clears throat> those, those exist and we will have to deal with it in the future. There are two more. Um, one is enlargement. Um, Slovenia, Hungary are interested that Serbia, Montenegro, Albania become member of the EU because these countries, Hungary and Slovenia, they wanted to uh, <clears throat> protect their flank for coming from there. Uh, and it's pushing very strong for, for, for instance, for uh, <clears throat> uh, Serbia to be admitted to the European Union. Uh, but the rest of Europe, the rest of the European Union, most of the Western countries, are less uh, interested in that. You know, this is again uh, uh, an ongoing uh, discussion. And the final one is economics. Um, there were many times issues on economics. Remember the politique de la chaise vide, uh, the de Gaulle. And uh, so on the economic front, there were also always some uh, issues. It was always re uh, re resolved. But there is a new element of it, which could be seen at the new generation um, um, fund, where there were the frugal four that wanted more loan and less, less, um, uh, less um, <clears throat> grants, so that again, the south-north economic issues came in. And what we have to realize, that any future economic integration becomes a fiscal issue, because the banking union you know, the common uh, <clears throat> uh, bank deposit scheme or the uh, resolution, plan replenishment of the resolution fund, it, it's all economic issue. And that pits Germany and the frugal against the others. Um, that seems to be the easiest way to, to solve the, uh, the uh, to solve. So I would stop here, I can answer answer questions, but let me, let me just uh, in conclusion finish that uh, <clears throat> Europe will never be united, so to say, if we don't recognize the diversity which is within the countries. With enlargement, that diversity has Im immensely increased. In the East, we learn about the history of France, Germany, the UK, etc., because it's part of the European history. But in the Western countries, they don't learn about the Eastern Europe. How many, how many people just in this room know the history of Hungary, Romania, Slovakia, Slovenia, Croatia, Serbia, as we do know about France, United States, Spain, etc.? Very few. Very few. And um, you have to realize that, that Diversity has tremendously increased with the, um, uh, with the enlargement to the East. And uh, I think unity is in diversity. That's my conclusion. Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, I think you, you raised a lot of issues. Uh, each of these issues is certainly worth a session on their own. But I hope we will have uh, room later to discuss some of them. But now, before we go into the discussion of these issues, I want to give the floor to Carolyn to give her initial remarks for this session. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, and uh, it's very nice to be with you. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, there's a school and a church next to me. So bear with me if, there, if there's some, uh, some additional sound not coming from me. I want, to, I want to go back a little to your original 
uh, question. Well, what do what do we think are the big challenges to the EU that the conference uh, on the future of Europe ought to 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 address? Um, and I I don't really think that this conference uh, can address the big challenges to the EU. Uh, we you can talk about them, of course. And if you go to the site of the conference, there are many, many themes that are all very good and very relevant, uh, no doubt about it. But I think uh, this is not really the, the way to move forward. Um, and I regret to say it because I really liked the citizens' assemblies that, that, that Emmanuel Macron uh, organized, uh, started to organize a few years ago. All these meetings that he went to personally, um uh, to talk really with, with 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 people and i really followed them you know i was sometimes glued to 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 uh, to facebook for hours when he would get into heated debates with with gilets jaunes um i've also followed citizens assemblies in in belgium and in ireland with with uh, with a lot of interest because they seem to be working rather well, you know, on selected topics like abortion law. Um, in Ireland, they really, they really manage to, to, to deliver. Um, but I'm afraid that for the EU, the, 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 this, this formula is not right or not right yet, because I'm actually also an optimist, just like uh, Calypso usually. Um, first of all, look, look where the conference uh, comes from, or the idea comes from. Uh, it is Emmanuel Macron's baby. Uh, he did it at home, and then he pushed it on to other member states, who perhaps with the best of intentions, I think also largely for domestic political reasons, but, but, but I think genuinely also with the best of intentions, but he pushed it on to other member states who were not interested at all, and who still are not interested at all. Um, Maybe Macron is very serious about it, but others are not. Uh, I remember the Netherlands and Hungary were fiercely against, but then, you know, holding out, the two of them uh, didn't work, so they, they, they sort of grudgingly uh, went along. They, they did not want to be seen blocking it, and so they went along uh, more or less. But in the in the best scenario even, there is no guarantee that any of the ideas coming out of the conference, and I have no doubt there are, there are lots of ideas going to come out, some of them very good, uh, will ever be implemented. So I think we need to be a little bit realistic here. Member states have always been at the wheel in Europe, and uh, now perhaps more than ever. And in, if you ask me, this is the main problem in Europe that member states are too powerful and taking too much place compared to citizens and European institutions. Um, if, you, if you think of, 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 of levels of governments, there are four, of course. You have the local level, you have the regional level, then comes the national level, and then there's the European level. And each level plays, uh, you know, uh, plays the role that it is supposed to take. Um, and what you see is that, is that the national level is taking too much place, a level above them, you know. Um, it is what they do in Europe is comparable to, let's say, one of the German lender interfering with national German tax law or one of the Dutch provinces blocking the appointment of a Dutch ambassador somewhere, you know. Um, they are constantly making sure that the level of governance above their heads cannot really function properly. So citizens can adopt all kinds of plans and proposals, but as long as this constellation is uh, like it is, it is ultimately up to the member states to do something with those ideas. And here comes my hesitation. On this point of implementation, I do not see any goodwill in the capitals or very little at the moment. And I think uh, many citizens feel this and not so many of them know about the conference. I'm always asking because it, it, it's interesting, you know, it can take off suddenly and get momentum, but so far I don't think it has. Um, participation is, is, is rather limited to say the least. It's a pity. And so I think this conference risks to become 
uh, the latest product of bad expectations management in the EU. And we can talk about this a little bit later uh, too, but it sort of creates the illusion that citizens really have a say while um, they do not really. Let me leave it there. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, let me get back to Calypso to give her the opportunity to respond to the uh, many challenges that George highlighted and especially the challenge of the lack of understanding between East and West. But also let me give you here a question we got from our audience at Slido from Jaroslav Pietras who asked, do we see a danger in the process from fake and deep fake news uh, in, in, in manipulation in this process? But maybe let me also a a answer s or say something else now, maybe push back a bit also um, on this whole question of can actually a conference like this that actually don't has the authority of an elected leader or doesn't have the, the kind of um, legislative power of a parliament really check politics, check the intergovernmental machine that we have here in Brussels, or is it more a PR exercise? So well, how make sure that the results that we get from this conference actually get any traction? Calypso? What is not, Nicholas, a PR exercise anyway in the EU? Politics is both PR and actual decisions. And the, and, and the problem is that, of course, decisions need both to be explained to citizens, but to also be informed by them. And in the world, we have ideal type democracy, but we have real existing imperfect democracies. And of course, um, and so our conversation cannot be about some ideal type, can be about marginal improvements to what we have. And, and so I would say that, of course, George is so right to outline these, these profound divides in the EU, not just East-West, of course East-West, um, because the trajectory, the historical trajectory and social trajectory of our countries are so different, but just a few years ago, we had North-South because we have deep, different economic systems. Um, and so all of these divides or migration, the relationship to the other, um, as George was so clear, the question becomes not whether we have divides, but whether the divides in Europe are actually uh, um, made visible by politics and managed in a way where they are crisscrossing. The problem with polarization in societies or among countries is when all the divides compound each other. Um, so you have the same countries that refuse uh, migrants who don't want to respect the rule of law, who are corrupt and who are in economic trouble. But actually, that's not the case in Europe. Um, we have crisscrossing divides. And so that is why our politics is so intense. But this is quite normal. Um, and, and so I would add then to turn to Carolyn's remarks um, that Carolyn I mean, you're so right that, of course, um, we can be doubtful that any system, any institutions that has control will give up the control, you know. Uh, but we are also in a world of taking back control to borrow one of the slogans that is so apropos these days. And everyone wants to take back control of their life, don't you, don't I, don't all of us? And so, you know, people, now have the means, there is a very different culture. I see it with my students, I see it many places. So they, they want to take back control. And in a way, whether the institutions like it or not. And so the key to the story is of course, collaborative network um, uh, work together. And in this story, where I might disagree with you slightly is that of course member states are key because there are two characteristics to the kind of issues we're dealing with um, today. They're urgent, there is almost a permanent state of emergency and they involve a lot of money. And yes, we now have almost 2% of, of EU GDP that is managed more or less by Brussels, more or less under the shadow of the member states. But nevertheless, the member states continue to be key and that's right and proper. The question becomes, how one, how do, how do they consider each other's interests when they sit around the table, uh, when they can't yield real threats vis-a-vis -vis each other? Um, what kind of incentives do they work on? And then how are they balanced by different channels of representation? 
different voices um, that represents oppositions, that represents cities, regions. This is particularly important for Hungary and Poland, but also many other countries, Italy, where I'm um, at now, uh, the, the decentralized multi-level of governance is very important. So I think we can have our cake and eat it too. We can have an EU where member states are key, but an EU where there is a whole bunch of other types of seats of power. And that means, Nicholas, that in the questions you ask, you know, I, if I had, well, had my response, I would say, well, yes, building a European police, a democratic, of democratic processes, but that in turn will serve a more, a better foreign policy and the kind of goals we're looking at, climate change, economic growth, because they need to be owned, especially when short-term sacrifices are asked for long-term goals, then you need to have different kinds of participatory mechanisms. Thank you, Cal Calypso, for this, uh, for this answer. Maybe this is a, a first chance to show the poll to see where our audience is on this question of um, what should our priority be. And uh, I have difficult reading this here. Um, let, let me see. So it's, it's a tie between na navigating a slight uh, advantage for navigating geopolitical uh, tensions and then basically achieving policy goals with 20% in, in, in the last place is building a European policy. Um, maybe let me give the floor back to Carolyn and, and, and let me add to, to for as an opportunity response to um, Crew Calypso, but let me add another question from our audiences, which is from Mathieu Metivier, which asks, why is the future conference of future happening now? Why did it take 15 years for us to, to recover from the constitutional um, fiasco? Carolyn. <laughs> That's a nice question. Um, I think uh, actually that the, 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 the trauma of, uh, of, 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 the, of the last big conference uh, was so huge that many, many uh, participants back then, member states, but also institutions are, you know, they're, 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 they can't think of having another one again because it was so, uh, such hard rowing. And many of them don't want treaty change. Huh? This is also a, this is also a, a big reason, I think. Um, and, but it all comes back, in a way, to the bad, bad expectations management I, I mentioned earlier. Um, people constantly expect uh, too much from the European Union, while the, the role it can play is often often rather rather modest. So people are constantly disappointed. You know, the, the debate is often uh, too much between the federalists on one side and the nationalists on the other side. For the federalists, uh, Europe is always, uh, it, it's never powerful enough. It's always weaker and slower than they would like. So they're, they're disappointed. And for the nationalists, uh, anything Europe does is already too much. So they are constantly disappointed too. And these two ends of the equation, they dominate uh, the deba debate about Europe. And in a way, you can see it already in the conference as well. Um, it, it dominates this debate and how, how uh, Europe should function and how it should move forward on, on, on big issues and small issues. Uh, but I think we should get out of this dynamic of, 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 of big changes uh, that the federalists want. And uh, on the other hand, uh, get out of the idea of the renationalization of Europe, the other extreme that the nationalists uh, want and look at what is realistically uh, possible. And I think a lot is possible realistically. Many things that need to be done uh, to make Europe function a little bit better, and those things have not been done, they do not require treaty change uh, at all. They can be implemented tomorrow. And I give you a few examples. Um, a smaller European Commission, more say for the European Parliament, a somewhat larger budget. Uh, so institutions do not have to do everything on a shoestring all the time because they get tasks and then they don't get the money for it by the member states. Um, another one could be less money going to agriculture uh, or 
finally, a more social Europe, European uh, social security. These are just a few examples that have been in the air uh, for a long time that many are pushing for. You don't need a conference for that. Um, and all these things can don't be done tomorrow if only the member states had the political uh, will uh, to do them. And so far, uh, they don't have this political will, alas. Um, so as I said, I find citizens for are very interesting. Yeah? They can be a, a very useful addition to the normal parliamentary uh, democratic process that is in trouble in, in, in many, many, many countries. Um, we, we can see this on, on, on several levels, but one precondition is that they focus on a well-described issue. And another one is that it is that it is clear from the start what the executive will do with the result or can do with the result. And both conditions, I think, are not met with the conference uh, on the future of Europe at all. Uh, citizens here are given the illusion that they can sort of redesign uh, the flaws of, of the European Union. And it goes in all directions. Um, but there is no guarantee at all of what, what will be done with the, with the outcome. And I fear that apart from some lip service thingies, uh, this will be rather little. So I think this exercise is regrettably uh, ill-conceived and the future of Europe will not be decided uh, there. Thank you, Carolyn. I think we have here a very clear distinction between Carolyn, who believes this is probably not the way forward, and Calypso, who, who hopes that this is a way forward to developing our European democracy. Now, I want to give back the floor to George and, and give you the opportunity to give us your take. Do you, are you more on the side of Calypso or Carolyn? And maybe let me add, add a question here, which is in, in your field of expertise in foreign policy, which you helped shape as an ambassador to the US, but also um, at, in your work at the IMF. Uh, it's, it's a field where our audience thinks it's maybe the most important policy area that we develop a common voice. But your home country, Hungary, is very often seen as the one that vetoes common foreign policy. So I wanted to ask you here on your take on what's the balance between here, the competencies at the national level and, and the European level and how we overcome the, the, the tension here. <coughs> uh, this is a very important question, of course, because it comes between uh, uh, the question of sovereignty. Now, let me just say that uh, COVID did bring about a centripetal um, uh, case. This is the, the new generation EU fund because it has solidarity and redistribution. From this, I say that, you know, there are a lot of things that we can still do on the economic side, economic integration. Um, we all know banking union, capital union, etc. But those centripetal forces, centrifugal forces that I mentioned, interfere with going ahead with those things. And that's why I think you have to think about those. Now, it's well known that nations live in their language. That everybody knows. But nations also live in their history. And history determines the thinking of the people and of the politicians. And that means that they have different views on how much sovereignty they want to give up from their historical background. They have different views about their security. I mean, France has certain and entirely different security questions, let's say of Serbia or Hungary, etc., because it, had, it has obligations in their former colonies, which is understood. Uh, <clears throat> so coming to a common rule or common approach on, on those things that are beyond economics and purely, I would say, more political, more political, would be much more difficult. The two together, there are, there, there are interconnections between the two, but we have to recognize that those are difficult things. And, uh, you know, when I'm talking uh, centrifugal forces, uh, you know, dysfunctionality doesn't mean disintegration. I mean, there's no alternative to, to, the, to the European Union. And uh, we have seen in the case of Brexit that leaving the European Union doesn't mean that you regain your full, 
full uh, sovereignty. You just dis had discussions before Brexit and you have discussions now, it's going on. So uh, <clears throat> that's an important point to, to, to remember as well. Now when it comes to, to the question that you asked, that um, uh, uh, geopolitics, uh, I think that the future of geopolitics would be the um, rivalry competition between the United States and China. Um, and we could see that, that Trump started to, uh, uh, to uh, in increase tariffs and, you know, uh, uh, and discuss about investments, etc. And Biden opted, not reduced it, opted. Because each country in the United States, each hegemon understands what their own interests are. And China will become very quickly uh, a very, its GDP will be higher than the GDP of the United States just because uh, 1.4 billion people versus 320 million. Um, and military power does not depend on per capita income. It depends on how big your GDP is and how much you can spend on, 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 uh, on, on armament and on military. And China is spending on military just like this over the last 15 years. Um, <clears throat> does not spend as much as in, in dollar terms as the United States, but don't forget that in, in the United States there are much, much sal higher salaries also for the, for the military, so that's, that's not armament <clears throat> in itself. But China is, wants to be a dominant uh, world power, will be a dominant world power. Why I'm saying that? Because what's the role in there for Europe? And that's, that's, that's a key question. Um, we don't have a common um, army, and I don't think we will have a real common army, maybe a rapid deployment force. Yes, that we can, we, there is talk about that. But, you know, France will not give up um, uh, sovereignty over its own army, over its own nuclear power, etc. So what Europe can do is, to be as competitive economically as it can, number one. Number two, try to have common uh, policies toward the United States and toward China so that they cannot divide and rule. And third, we can have a role in regional conflicts, not that we want to, but regional conflicts will, end, will, will be, we can have an intermediary role which we already had, France had already several times tried to do that in the Middle East. <clears throat> so th that's how I feel, but Europe is, is an un, uh, uh, uncomfortable way uh, between this, the fight of these two, uh, 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 <coughs> of these two big powers, and we have to be very careful, and we have to be very, very competitive, because uh, EU, Europe has an advantage in innovation, uh, China has a big, big innovative um, capacity. The United States has a big innovative capacity. The brain drain from Europe, from everywhere, you know, helps the United States and, of course, more money, more resources. But Europe does have it as well. And <clears throat> this is where we can sort of um, um, uh, survive and move um, uh, within these two two hegemons, but we are looking for, forward, this is my final word, we are looking forward to a much, much complicated, competitive world order, world order, than we, are, we have been used to until now. Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, I, let me give back the floor back to Calypso to respond to this also to this challenge of foreign policy and, and also to the question we heard from Carolyn, this reluctance to open treaty change. What would be your recommendation to policymakers here in Brussels? Um, what they, should they do to make sure that the conference on the future of Europe is going to be a success? And what should be the priorities in, in, this, in this process? Well, on your two questions, Nicholas, I mean, I would say, first of all, on, um, on, on in fact, your poll and your audience, um, I think, interestingly, the Google uh, audience reflects uh, European publics at large. When they're asked what is to be done, they want more Europe uh, along the lines of your questions, climate, foreign policy, social, as Karen was saying. 
Uh, but when they ask, when uh, they're not ask, asked not what, but how, they want it closer to home. So in, in other words, I don't, I'm not sure what we really have in Europe is this huge polar division, but in general, Europeans are integrationists on substance and more sovereignist or localist on method. Um, and the problem is of course to echo George's point just now is that the balance between those two is struck differently across countries and social classes. But in fact, instead of a generalized polarization, I think there are variants of ambivalence among European publics between the what and the how, between doing more together, but doing it more in a decentralized way closer to home. Um, and so clearly the solution to that is in part, you know, what we call differentiated integration in our EU jargon. And of course, the problem with that is, a, is also centrifugal, as George would say, so you create conditions. So my first advice would be to think very, very hard and much harder about the kind of conditions that will make differentiated integration in the future workable. Uh, what common core beyond the single market, um, especially in the EMU-related areas? What are the rules of access and exit from these? What is the division of labor? Super important in migration. We won't get all countries to take in migrants. Um, maybe there is um, a, a requirement for states to be a bit less gatekeepers and let regions and, and cities do their own thing there and others compensate them financially. There, many, much is possible. And that leads me to my the second point to reply to Carolyn, which is very much that, hey, Let's remember the EU is an experiment. Experiments fail more often than they <laughs> succeed. Um, so same for the likelihood that we give coffee to succeed. We don't even know what it would mean for coffee to succeed. We don't even have criteria. But if there's a bit of a buzz, and if, um, and if some change comes from that, you know, everything is incremental in the EU. And so I would completely agree with Carolyn that um, it's a bit of a pity that everybody's concentrating on treaty change as this will be the sign of success. Why? Um, you know, in, in life, you have got institutions, rules, regulation, all this kind of formal uh, things. And more or less in Europe, this is quite stable. It's quite, we have quite a stable constitutional settlement in Europe. But there is also the praxis and the ethos that informs that practice mindset, um, specific implementation mechanisms. And so that's where the game is today. Because indeed, I don't really see treaty change for all the reasons we Darren said. So on external policy, uh, George, I would say we're less in a G2 world than a G zero world. And that you know Europe can have more strategic savviness, if not autonomy, by doing multilateralism slightly differently. Much to say about that trade policy, much more mutual, cooperative, uh, rather than unilateral. Um, you know, we don't have time to go into that. But finally, you know, on the front of democracy, which remains the key of it all, this is not idealistic googly group. This is very concrete. It's about ownership by citizens of the EU. It's, we've, been, we've been talking about this for 30 years. Um, and you know, we need to respect the role of technocracy, bureaucracy, and politics. But if citizens are asked what they think and see that they're asked, because citizens assembly are very small bits you know, in the middle of uh, huge um, seas of citizens, then yes, these are experiments and they need to be discussing very hardcore, difficult trade-offs. If you simply ask citizens, you know, should there be good weather all the time? They'll say yes. So you need to ask them about, you know, trade-offs that have to do with who has power, who decides when, how, um, timing, sequence, long-term policies, all of these. Um, and all of this in a context where it, it is convincing that such processes are supplement to formal representation. Um, I think you, Caroline is absolutely right. In that world of formal representation, there is huge skepticism about these new democratic innovations. But you know what? They're going to happen anyway. They are happening around the world. And this is a kind of experiment that the EU cannot afford not to engage into. And I trust. And I know that many in EU institutions are actually committed to this. Now, whether we'll all succeed, you know, 
<laughs> There's nothing harder to predict than the future. Thank you, Calypso. Let me give the floor back to Carolyn to opportunity to respond and also maybe the same question to you. What you argued earlier that you're more in favor of, uh, of evolution than revolution. What would be for you the, the steps that you would propose to go forward? Uh, would something like the differentiate integration be, be an option for you or do you think a different approach should be taken? Uh, yes, I think that would be an option, but it would will only be an option, I think, that rises, uh, that comes up because of a, a, a crisis. You know, I've been I've been living in, in in Vienna and working on the on the on the old Habsburg Empire for 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 quite a while, and I am struck with the with the uh, with the parallels between the two. Well, Habsburg was was a state, of course, and the EU isn't, but. Both in, both uh, were just sort of providing a roof over the heads of many nations and language groups that all wanted to go in a different direction uh, and wanted uh, to get more rights for themselves and maybe for others later, who all had different, uh, saw different um, um, challenges and dangers. Um, and those kind of Organisms or beasts or how, how or whatever you call them, they are they change slowly by themselves. Um, but when the world changes and when the constituent parts also change, uh, there's demand from the outside. These are the, the geopolitical developments that 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 we talked about earlier. Um, but also from within, people want a more of a say. Uh, so when there's pressure from both sides, th th the beast changes. You know, I move every every four years to a different place in Europe. And each time uh, it, I find it, I'm just moving back now to Brussels from Oslo. Um, each time I clean up my desk and I have piles of paper everywhere. And I'm each time we all complain that the EU is so slow and so... Um, uh, you know, taking minimal steps and so on. And so I look at all those papers, like, do I take it to my next posting or do I throw it, do I throw them away? I throw so many things away because they have been done already. You know, it's only when you look back over all the, all the, uh, all the papers that you've accumulated over, over, over the past four or five years that you realize like, ah, this was done as well. But once you're in it, like during the euro crisis or the refugee crisis, you, you see only the very, very small steps. But once you, once you look, look back and take a little bit of a distance, you see actually that we are moving forward. The EU, the, the Brussels that I'm coming back to now after eight years is not the same Brussels. It's, 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 it's debating different issues. It's, there, 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 there are other challenges. There are other hopes as well. Uh, things that looked very bleak maybe eight years ago are now, um, are now looking much better. And this is in a very uh, zigzagging way forced by uh, demand from the inside, but also from the outside. This is how the EU changes. So in that sense, I'm very optimistic, just like Calypso, that we will, we will change. We will, we will do it because we've always done it. You know, I covered the euro crisis and everybody thought that, you know, every day the headlines were the EU is going to implode or explode or both. No, the EU survived it because leaders, I think this is a big lesson from all the crises that we've been through. Leaders wanted to survive. So only sometimes when, they, when they're at the precipice and they see how deep it is down there, they take the steps that they maybe beforehand knew they, they, they had to take but didn't like to. But once, you know, vital elements of the EU, like the internal market, are at stake, they, they compromise. But it's never the way you think it will go. <laughs> So yes, it's Europe develops always, and in in that sense, I think uh, experiments. I'm 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 not against uh, con uh, experiments like the conference on the future of Europe. The only thing I'm saying is that we should not expect too much, uh, or f 
you know, f focus at one point. No, it, it goes, it can go in different directions. I think we should all be very flexible in that. End of speech. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think that's a very hopeful message um, to look back. Maybe the last 10 years were not as stagnant as I said in the beginning. Let me give the last word to George, for him also the opportunity to say what he thinks Europe or leaders here in Brussels should do to address the centrifugal uh, forces that you mentioned in the beginning. <clears throat> I think the most important thing would be to, to recognize the differences between countries. Uh, because those differences, historic differences, religious differences, influence the thinking of politicians, of people, politicians, and the way they think about their own national interest. It doesn't mean that you cannot cooperate. You have to cooperate. To, uh, but you have to, you cannot, sometimes I have the feeling that people want to, have one way of thinking and this is what's good for everybody else. That doesn't work. It's never worked. So, uh, <clears throat> You, you have to be sensitive to, uh, to the differences, etc. And let me, let me raise this issue because I am sure it's in the mind of a lot of, lot of people. Because Hungary and Poland is criticized for its democratic uh, <clears throat> um, values, etc. There is never an end road in democracy. Just think of how long it took the UK, the US, France achieve centuries to achieve what, what, what is it now. Central and Eastern Europe did not have full democracy before the, first, before the Second World War. And then they lost 40 years uh, under a very brutal Soviet communist rule. So, you know, it, it, it goes, they have a different view of, of many things. One thing which is true that they want to be um, a member of the European Union, neither the Polish or the Hungarian government has ever said that they don't want to be, they want a strong Europe. And, and then there are discussions, and that discussions should be done in good faith, understanding the um, the differences, and uh, and then it will and it will go. And as I said earlier, it's very important that uh, Europe remains united uh, because we have to become we have to remain very competitive when around us. There are two big hegemons that are very competitive. That's my last word. Thank you very much. I think also this, uh, with historical perspective, a hopeful message. I'm afraid this is all that we have time for today. I want to uh, thank all the panelists for this excellent discussion and the audience for staying with us today. Thank you very much. <laughs>